I made some notes just to introduce this session um, to explain why uh, I invited uh, those two guests. Um, if a right to the city is not only a claim but a consistent reality, architecture must respond by supporting various modes of appropriation and creating spaces open to diverse lifestyles. Relating to the everyday of urban practices can take many forms though and is articulated through very different approaches. Uh, what I'm talking about here and, and what is the base for this session is that I think that there is a shift uh, uh, which is um, changing our urban uh, space and um, th that I think that architecture has to relate differently to to urban space as it did before. We could say that in the 20th century, uh, the city has been organized by, uh, by assignment, uh, by functional assignments. Uh, also democratic cities are organized like this and these are the cities we live in today. Uh, this, this assignment is certainly not oppressing, but it, 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 it is to protect, it is to liberate. Uh, but we're confronted today with a, with a city where, and that's why we refer to the right to the city, it's not just only a claim, it's just a reali reality that everybody is equal in that city, has got the same rights. So we have a problem, everybody has to have the same access, not only the same right, but the same access to the city. And this changes really relations. And this... Uh, is asking questions to how you produce uh, architecture. And that's the reason why uh, we invited Jean-Philippe Vassal and Jesper Fetzer. I think they have, uh, in a way, different approaches to that same topic of relational space and how to produce architecture in this, architectural design in this relational place. Um, I think the first speaker will be uh, Jean-Philippe Vassal, but I would like to introduce you both um, to then uh, go into your presentations and um, the discussion. Uh, Jean-Philippe uh, Vassal is an architect and principal of Lacaton Vassal Architect, uh, which uh, he co-founded with Anne Lacaton in Bordeaux in 1987. Uh, he graduated from the School of Architecture in Bordeaux in 1980 and spent then five years in Niger, Niger uh, as an architect and town planner. I think this is very relevant and I think you will discover that in, in, in his works. Uh, Lacaton Vassal received several awards, among them the Grand Prix National d'Architecture in France in 2008, etc. Et International Fellowship of the Royal Institute of British Architects. Jean-Philippe Vassal has been visiting professor at institutes uh, at the Architecture School of Versailles, the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Lausanne, and since 2012, he te he's teaching in, in Berlin. I think first at the TU, and then now at the uni University Universität der Künste Berlin. Uh, when I, s when I uh, saw you, the first time I saw a project of yours, I think it's, it really, I think it's 20 years ago. And yeah, it's a long time. It was in a, it was in a, it, it was an art magazine. It was not an architectural magazine. It was an, it was an art magazine. It was Springer, Springerin, Springerin, uh, I think it's Austrian. And I, I saw this picture, I think it was uh, uh, in, in a choir, a building in choir, uh, so in the territory of Bordeaux, you would say. But you could instantly see, uh, when you saw that image, you see there is a completely different relation to what a space could be, a, a habitat could be, and also in that peripheral um, surrounding of, of, of Bordeaux, there was a completely different approach. Can you hear me? Yeah? No? Ah, it's difficult. <laughs> okay. Um, so I thought, damn, this is really different, and then I've, I, I've been following uh, your projects and, and how you developed and um, how the size of a project changes, but not the approach uh, to architecture in, in general. And um, 
I think uh, two things are important uh, in your work. Uh, one is that you really create spaces which allow multiple forms of appropriation and that you also relate to the city in a very, uh, I would say, natural way. Well, we, we could relate to what you stated in the, in the session before. Jesko Feza, uh, I will introduce you to because I, I think this will work best, um, is professor for experimental design at the Hochschule für Bildende Künste in Hamburg, HFBK. As an architect, he carries out projects in cooperation with uh, IFAR, so that's we are working together as architects sometimes, uh, or more more or less often. Um, he is co-founder of a bookstore ProQM in Berlin and part of the exhibition design studio Kooperative für Darstellungspolitik. Jesko Feser is co-editor of the publication series Studienhefte für Proble Pro Problemorientiertes Design and of Bauwelt Fundamente, member of the Hamburger Kunstkommission and uh, of the DGTF board. His research, research interests vary from design methodology to the politics of design and I think that is also what what you are talking about today. Um, same reason to invite you as, uh, as also to, to invite Jean-Philippe. I think it's about how you relate to the city, to urban space with the projects you are doing, in this case with your students at HFBK and I have to say I have to say that both uh, Jean-Philippe and Jesko are not only admiring them as architects and designers, but especially as teachers. Can you hear me? Or yeah, good. <laughs> and um, Jesko will uh, present us works he's doing with his students at Öffentliche Gestaltungsberatung St. Pauli. So this is really projects going into the space directly. So I won't take any longer. And um, I would uh, like Jean-Philippe to start with his presentation. So I want to talk about space, because I think it's the most important point. And I would like to start with the smallest fragment as possible, because uh, the landscape, the city, it is just the agglomeration and the multiplication of all of these fragments. Um, power space. Space has a lot of power. Uh, how it is possible to, to do with what exists or how to transform it in order to, to make it possible for relations, for freedom. The search for freedom is especially extremely important. Freedom for everyone. And I think we should start, come back to very simple things. Planting some branches in the sand, bending them with your neighbors, and then placing some straw around to protect from the wind. And to place a roof on top of that. Just a straw hut with a fence around and nine posts close to it with a roof in order to see the landscape from that. This was my, my first house that we built with my neighbors 30 years ago. Simple facts, very, very simple facts. But they touch and they attach to the architecture of archi the, the history of architecture. Case study house program in the 50s in US. Social housing program and extremely luxurious houses in the same time. Come back to very simple facts. Floors like ground, because you need floors to walk, to be free, to run, to s jump, to lay. You, we need square metres. So, back to Maison Domino. Columns, beams, floors, stairs, that's all. Multiplying the ground. Maison Domino like this, in Albania, that I see last uh, holidays. You start living upstairs, downstairs, in the middle, where you want. Freedom. Playing with climate, not fighting against. Thinking about how to use the climate. 
when today we have the feeling that we are just fighting against maximum of insulation when we should take all what the climate can give and working with that in different seasons. Each day the house is different. If it is summer, winter, day, night, rainy, sunny, etc. And we have some examples of that, like this project of Hayoko in Berlin, Tiergarten, Eco Oiso, how it is possible to build inside the forest without touching the trees, keeping the trees, and to talk with the people, and just establishing a system of platforms, seven meters from top of each others. And then to see with the people how these platforms could become grounds. And on each of these grounds, each family could make its own house with its own architect or by herself, like an auto construction. And just a sort of global organization of quantity of space that we could deal with. And then just establishing this multiplication of grounds and leave people build on top of this. And now, today, 20 years later, it is one of the most fantastic places to live in Berlin. Playing with creating grounds, dealing with climates, exposures, exposures gardens, balconies, balgan, uh, gardens at plenty of spaces, plenty of levels. We have, I am I really interested by the period of the 70s, 60s, 70s, 80s, because at this time I have the feeling that you have a lot of architecture and urbanism with a lot of generosity. And this question of generosity, I'm, not, I, I'm looking for it now. This was a project of Hayoto that was refused by the IBA. That was more radical. And finally, they take the one in Tiergarten because they think it would be more invisible. Another project in the same period, next 21, in Osaka. Also a question of using space, trying to f find freedom in different spaces. Jona Friedman, a drawing that he makes for Berlin recently. Something that we could use, a first step to give possibility, opportunities. In Abitin, beyond the functional conveys pleasure, generosity, the freedom to occupy a space. A space for living must be generous, comfortable, adaptable, flexible, luxurious, affordable. Dwellings must offer freedoms of usage to gener generate possibilities for evolution, for interpretation and appropriation. In general, standards of housing are too small, too restricting. The principle of standard minimum for the living space is wrong. Offer as much extra space as programmed space to promote relationships with within spaces to bring about pleasurable situations. This extra space is a non-defined space, free for use, added to the traditional spaces. Every dwelling should have a private outside space, as a balcony, a terrace, a winter garden, to give the possibility of living outside, of having a garden, like a single house. It is necessary to create living spaces much more generous, as large as possible, to multiply the space for uses and appropriation. Dwellings should have the same facility as a villa. Instead of the standard, more possibilities. A dwelling must offer the inhabitant opportunities to move around, to turn, mobility, possibility to escape by a, a window or to come back by, by another door. System of constructions should be more flexible instead of the standard, just columns, beams, and floors to create more spaces, more possibilities, more openings. The same for the climate. Inside of 30 centimeters of insulation, try to think of a buffer zone, a sort of intermediate space where activities could happen, where nothing can happen inside insulation. 
It means building larger, twice more, building double, in the same cost as a standard dwelling to be affordable for everyone. Building double will create other possibilities, other freedoms, new ways of inhabiting. To fully inhabit, to reason norm, take compressed space, and to allow this freedom of users, to transform and enlarge what exists instead of demolishing it, to offer twice more space to each person, necessary and essential conditions to any project of increasing the density. A dwelling should have the same facilities as a villa. Our aim is to redevelop in the cities this concept of villa, houses with garden. And then the idea of luxury is redefined in terms of generosity, freedom of use, and pleasure. Like the house Nestor was talking, Maison La Tapie. A house that is three times bigger than the most cheaper standard house that you can find, that has been the result of an adventure with our clients. Collective housing. Oh, it was possible to have a sort of freedom of concept in order to say, instead of the standard, could we try to imagine new ways of living, playing with grounds and climate, organizing grounds and climate in order to produce some social housing, standard housing that are nearly two or three times bigger than the standard one for the same price. And at these conditions to say there is, because the cost is the same as the standard, there is no reason for the rent to be higher, to make the rent in function of the cost of the building and not in function of the market. Or transforming instead of demolishing, like in Bordeaux, 500 buildings transformed at the moment where it should be demolished to try to convince that the transformation adding 50% of the, to the existing is much better than taking down all what exists and to re rebuild the houses needed by the population. Spending less to do more. Like it was, like it is transformed. Like it was, transformation for each flat, extension. New ways of living, new possibilities, more freedom, 50% of extension for each flat in order to produce new flats with the transformed ones. And just to finish, I would like to show you this project at the urban scale, which is about a comment to make, to see how it was possible to have 50,000 new dwellings in the city of Bordeaux for 10 years coming, and how we have proposed something totally different from the master plans and uh, urban plan that was uh, expected, and what we have think about the existing. 50 thousand new dwellings, 55 and 200 hectares of existing nature. The exist official nature and the real one. 50,000 new dwellings, 55 and 200 hectares well-serviced lands, the roads, the networks, everything is already there. We don't have to make more of them. 50,000 new dwellings, 160 thousand existing collective housing, 80,000 existing single housing in the city of Bordeaux, 50,000 new dwellings, hundreds of capable situations, territory is wide, friendly, the nature is easily accessible, enough thick or clear, simulate or hidden, contrast and values, enough irrigated, drained, furrowed, crossed, served, forward, organized, enough capable to generate inside its existing organizations in connection with its systems, its roads, with no new master plans and schemes of impulsive and visionary urbanists, neither formatting nor toolbox, 
without the necessity to cut or demolish, without having to break up, dismantle and reset, without disturbing, transform, weakest and less appreciated existing housing, and in the same time, 50,000, 100,000, 150,000 new dwellings, large, luminous, generous, and lasting. Spend less to do more. Never demolish. Transform. Save cost of working. 62% cost of economy. Save energies. 70% of energy savings. Save cost of public facilities. Create new housing and services. 120 flats instead of using 100. Reduce heating and maintenance loads. 60% less. Never cut trees. Give air and fluidity. Give space and luminosity. Thanks to an accurate urbanism, carefully case by case, with a special care for organizations, differences, people, trees, and birds. With the precision of urban economy, one feet on the ground from each dwelling, each garden. Liberate the urban rights and use, keep in good repair. Be careful to the special qualities, their abilities. Make easier the private initiative. Grant the management of public areas to the private initiative. Open the view, boost the pleasure of dwelling. Simply from the inside of living areas with delicacy, existing ground floor apartment. Take off window seal, opening on the garden. Offer the use of the garden. Contribute to the public areas between the private gardens. Existing collective, social or private dwelling. Metamorphosis of an existing dwelling, more space, more light, more fluency, less energy consuming. By generous additions of winter gardens or balconies for every dwelling, for every families. On the same serviced land, create new dwellings without consuming new territories. Disused facilities divided in private lots. Purchase large surfaces not yet untapped, serviced to live and work differently. Little by little, take over the dimensions. Metamorphosing them. Looking for wonderful. Offer a variety of ways to live, ways to rent, ways to acquire some property. Enjoy outstanding geography. Enjoy the freedom use like in a villa. Enjoy fluent and generous areas. Enjoy a large and true garden. Enjoy the outstanding view from the rooftops. Enjoy canopies without sacrificing them. Enjoy the charm of small housing, large private intimate, intimate spaces. Enjoy oversized spaces. Extend, add, back on, mix, optimize, superimpose, to do or not to do. Apartments block in Ambares, 79 existing buildings. Apartment blocks in Ambares, 79 existing buildings, enlarged and insulated, plus 69 new flats. Thanks a lot for the invitation. Um, a 
as Christoph already mentioned, um, I'm teaching experimental design. That's probably also the reason why I'm arguing from the perspective of the field of design. I'm not meaning industrial design or product design or graphic design. It's more kind of a general understanding um, of design of something um, dealing with intentional transformations. In German, you would maybe say Entwurf or Gestaltung or Planung. Um, and maybe it's the same um, as architecture, but it obviously has um, little less to do with houses and plants. And maybe what we try to focus is a little bit more about social relations, uh, uh, focusing on socio-spatial relations or focusing on socio-material relations. So as you can see, um, I'm interested in relations in uh, mainly socio-spatial, socio-material relations. And that's also why I'm thankful to be part of this uh, series of talks and discussions, and I uh, really agree and uh, support the perspective of this um, conference, uh, that architecture, or as I would say, that any kind of design needs to be, and I'm doing a citation, needs to be related to the urban cultural, technological practices and to societal and spatial developments. But I would like to go a little bit further, um, I would um, like to argue that design is by definition about social, cultural and material relations. There is no choice. This is not something that we can have or not have, not something that we can have more intense or less intense. There is no need to relate. Design is based on relations. We cannot think anything without those relations. I think you all can imagine what kind of relations I meet, at least the material, the physiological, the social, the technical, the economic relations, all these kind of necessities to be able to think about design. And that's what I, um, what I uh, would be my, my, my starting point, that design is in itself a deeply related, a deeply situated, a deeply dependent social practice, um, and by that a political practice. The question is less if design is related, but is more how is it related? And how do we want as designers um, structure, develop, and intensify its relation? And this question is by no means a new question. It's a very old question, and it was Viktor Papanek who kind of made a nice diagram on these questions of the relation between the world and the designer. It's this diagram here, it's a pyramid or a triangular, and there's a small upper part which is black, and he named it the designer's share, so the, the part of the problem um, that the designers are dealing with, and the big one is the real problem. And he, he, he used this diagram three times, uh, the design problem, the country, and the world, and I will explain it the other way around as he did. So he's arguing that the world um, is the real problem, and that the designers obviously only are kind of concerned with a very, very small part of it. He was meaning the Western um, um, part of the world where design as a kind of discipline, where as a discourse, as a technology um, was established, was kind of cultivated and was implemented. And he was arguing that in the rest of the world, it's not uh, a place where designers look at or care for, which was right in the 1970s and is still right today, but of course this relation between the Western world and the, um, this kind of ideology of a, a Western modernist discipline has changed and is about to change, and we are kind of thinking in a, um, try to think in a post-colonial manner about uh, global relations, but it's something that we have still have to have in mind when we talk about relations to the world, that the relation um, is based on a kind of Western perspective. The second diagram, the same slide, is um, he names it a country, I would say it's, he was what he had in mind was more society, that he argues that designers' share of a society is very small. The designers, the product designers, only work with companies, graphic designers with agencies, we work with governments, we work with clients who can afford to have a house, we work with uh, schools, we work with people who hire designers, who hire architects, who hire planners, and who give briefs to them. This is only a very small amount um, of society and all those others um, taking part in the society and thus 
not, not talking about minorities, about talking about majorities, are not part of the problem, not part of the um, design world. And the second and the third diagram is the same one, and it's called the design problem, figure one. Um, and he's arguing that the designer's share of a problem is even if we are only in a part of the world, if we're only dealing with a part of society, we only have a look at a minor part of a problem. He's m he, in his mind, it's mostly the aesthetic um, part of a problem or the technical part of a problem or the an innovative part of a problem, but we are not able to kind of understand the full relatedness of a problem. So he's complaining with these diagrams about a lack of relatedness. We have no relations to the global context, we have no relation to most of the people in our society and we have no relation to most of the aspects of a complex design problem, be it a cup or a lamp or a chair or a house or a plane or whatever. And um, I think this is interesting and still true and many of us um, have been struggled with this um, problematic and um, I would say the, the project I'm now briefly um, explaining to you Christoph mentioned it, the Public Design Support Project, Öffentliche Gestaltungsberatung, um, is about that. It's a long-term academic research for ways of relating differently or intensively to the urban and its actors or inhabitants. So what is uh, Öffentliche Gestaltungsberatung? It's a very simple project established in 2011 by students of the Halfbecker Hamburg in my studio. Um, you need a kind of a space where you can hang out, discuss, and where people can come around. Um, this first one was in St. Pauli, this is in Belgrade, um, this is a meeting in um, Seoul, Korea, and um, this is in Mexico City, a temporary studio. You need some opening hours where people from the neighborhood could come around um, and where they are invited to tell about their daily problems, their ideas, their issues, um, the themes that they are kind of dealing with, uh, with and where they can kind of become client or um, for a project. And this is a starting point um, for all the projects and most of the projects do in the studio. The people come with their issues and problems, discuss with us, and then we go in long-term projects together with them. This is in St. Pauli, together with the GBR at the Heim College Platz, where we have opening hours from 6 to 9 each Wednesday. We do projects with the residents of the Nibur um, um, blocks, where they asked us for opportunities to meet against um, renovation and privatization of their apartments. We built a kind of um, temporary table system for the corridors. Um, this is uh, um, the Sailor's Inn, which was demolished by the investor, and we gave them a new ceiling showing the demolition process of the former uh, bar. This uh, was the ESSO Housing Initiative, who asked us to help them to develop alternative ideas for the building, and we built a big-scale model of the apartments of the houses, which were later used as a barbecue by them. Um, this was in Istanbul, a local initiative um, needed support to um, work on a park they wanted to establish and we helped them um, to clean it up and have some sport facilities like a mega backgammon or a soccer place or a tea pavilion there. Um, this was a decoration problem of an uh, elderly woman who in the end wanted some highlight elements for their nippers decoration in their apartment. This was a woman with her daughter who needed to, wanted to solve the storage problem for chairs in the corridor, and we transformed an industrial shelving system for a, a cabinet that fitted exactly to their needs and number of shoes. Um, this was a project with a woman who had difficulties to organize their stuff in her working, um, in her private um, working um, room. This was a project um, to um, develop a flexible system for public exhibitions, discussions, talks based on umbrellas and concrete plates. A woman in Eimsbüttel or two women asked us for a, in their apartment house to have a collective meeting space out there in summertime and we installed a roof and a movable table there. In a 
the Belgrade uh, Roma family um, uh, who lived in a house destroyed by a fire, fire a few weeks ago um, asked us to help them to get new furniture and we built um, furniture for their apartment. The microphone is broken, huh? You sure? Hello? Better? Stronger? Okay, great. This was a kind of um, rural performance uh, for, a, um, for a farmer in um, Mardin in Turkey to test out his um, rural areas. This was in Mexico City with the local community, the Otomi people. Um, who had in their uh, who wanted to re um, reuse their former collective space, and uh, we helped them to reorganize their stuff and to um, to paint it collectively um, with them, or um, with a local initiative in Mexico City uh, who wanted to have a meeting point um, in the public area, and we um, built a kind of a meeting and communication area there. Or finally, um, two projects together with the Zeit. Um, in, uh, one was in Lemgo, uh, where a third grade um, class asked us to help them to clean up their classroom. And we developed a new furniture principle with one big round table, one bench on the window, and one seating area on the floor, which transformed all the kind of working and teaching and learning relations. Um, or a refugee accommodation in Lübeck where together with the residents, the beds, a uh, collective kitchen area was kind of furnished, uh, but also um, the showers downstairs were repaired. So these are some of the projects we do, and maybe they give an insight in the, in the broad range of design activities, but also how we, we try to relate to local uh, problems, people, and ideas. And um, to conclude this presentation, I would like to read a short text with a, another microphone, maybe. sounds a little bit, I have a deeper voice than it sounds like, okay, <laughs> I don't care. <coughs> um, so when, when I talk or we talk here about the social relation of design practice, I think a well-known and unsolvable contradiction has to be mentioned. And this is the designer's egocentric interest in other people's problems. In the history of design, as an agent of enlightenment and universalistic ideals, design has always been a benevolent, paternalistic practice with all kinds of good intentions involving others and their supposed problems. These others and their problems were identified with professional expertise. They have always been measured and described using the latest tools such as statistics, hygiene, ergonomics, anthropology and market research. The range of values against which these problems of the others and therefore the strategies for solving them were measured and became visible was the normality of a bourgeois white male Western society. This perspective guided the discussions on the housing questions at the end of the 19th century as well as the early modernist criticism of the ornament or the later Werkbund Initiative for the Gute Form. It's inscribed in our modernist and postmodernist conception of architecture, design, and urban planning. The self-perception of designers, architects, and planners cultivated a view onto others who shall benefit from good design deeds. Because the concept of others is, however, difficult, difficult to grasp, this external relation of design always also reminds a self-reference on the part of the designer in an effort to compensate for any lack of understanding. Even more committed and engaged practices or approaches to design, such as social or critical design, are tied by this dilemma. After all, it is always about others, about those to be helped, so those who should benefit from design or those who see and experience it and gain insight from it. The present obligation towards self-design only appears to resolve this contradiction, likewise the popularization of do-it-yourself. Both 
Zeus attribute this acting on behalf of others to the protagonists who now face themselves in a paternalistic and benevolent manner. Other design approaches pursue a strategy of restraint, developing open systems or aiming for participation in co-design. Yet the challenge remains to avoid hierarchies or at least reduce their effect in relations to other. A different model I want to bring in today for design would be partisan or biased design. In Germany, I would say parteiisches design, which is maybe more precise because partisan sounds like partisan, but it means voreingenommen, parteiisch, being on one side. Partisan design is not understood as designing the arena of possible conflict, not as designing mediating structures or participative processes of exchange, compromises and agreement. Partisan design does not regard design as an area of, of activity by distanced or insightful observers or courageous and sensitive interventionists, not as an ultimate superior perspective of the social play of differences. Partisan design locates creating directly within these conflicts in the thick of things and topics negotiated there and among the protagonists of these conflicts and their attitudes. In other words, if design is political, there must also be right-wing and left-wing design, just as there are conservative and progressive social and neoliberal politics. As impossible as it would be to conceive design without the demand of transformation and transformation outside the political, politics without partisanship is equal impossible. Partisan design no longer means providing evidence of a humanistic world view, projecting personal ideas of a good life onto others. others. This harmonious image must be replaced with one marked by irresolvable conflicts. Together with the protagonists and topics of these conflicts, it could actually be possible to enter the political level of disputes about ideas and practices of togetherness in a lively form of argument. So maybe to conclude, and maybe the project of Gestaltungsberatung is a bad example for this idea of a partisan design, but what we are kind of experiencing there and trying out there is um, to enter into the city, to enter in a city lived by people, not uh, with a kind of view on the other as something um, from a certain distance, which we try to understand, to observe, and then to modify, but entering the conflicts, entering the daily problematics of a city by taking side of one single person, of a specific group, of one idea of a city, how it should be, or, an, or a quarter or a street, and not um, um, staying in this kind of distance, but well-intended um, position that designers, architects, and planners usually are used to. So, thanks for your patience. Okay, so um, thanks a lot for those presentations. I'm, I'm, I have to say, um, I, I'm so happy to have you here. You're able to say things which I would never be able to tell to my students. And uh, yeah, I'm really glad. I think it's cool. <laughs> so um, I would like to, to just to organize this discussion a bit, but really feel free to ask questions. Uh, I will just only try to, to tip on two topics. Uh, as I mentioned in the in introduction, which I already read because my English is not so good, um, the, the city, the contemporary city, um, the introduction to this session mentions Henri, Henri Lefebvre's claim for the right to the city, roughly speaking, the right to avail oneself of all the possibilities and commodities the city has to offer which is today a crucial basis for making a living. While the 20th century city is subdivided by functional and social determinations, which is ex excluding as well as including promises of wealth and welfare, the contemporary city has to provide equal access to knowledge and work and to allow for diversity and different lifestyles. 
So I already mentioned it in, in the introduction, but I, I really think that you are approaching the city in a different way and that this has got something to do with uh, political situations, with contemporary situations. W would you agree that there is a shift in new premises changing relations in urban space? I mean, I, th I think you, you already showed it. Maybe, Jesko, you would like to start. I would answer uh, um, with two perspectives. On the one hand, I would like to argue that the modernist, functionally organized and socially segregated city is still existing. Maybe it's not the factory and the working uh, people housing area, maybe it's more the inner city, the, the headquarter, the consumer city, and um, s some other inner or uh, out city uh, peripheries, uh, which, uh, which are still distinguishable, which are still experienceable, and are still kind of um, showing the right place for certain groups of a society to live or to uh, to work or to consume in. So we have still a segregated and a, and a divided city, but it's, it's a modified, uh, modified um, um, uh, division. And the second important thing is that, and that is, that's the most important shift, that this segregation is uh, transforming constantly and at a very high speed. So former, as everybody knows, former working or migrant quarters can become shopping quarters, former inner city, run-down areas can become uh, little capital uh, centers of um, new capitals. And, um, and, and the tools of planning and architecture and also the tools of the city officials, uh, planning institutions, are not able um, to deal with this kind of dynamic and powerful um, rhythms of um, change um, and of new segregations that are implemented. And that's also the reason why, why I think that everybody who is politically conscious is looking for new tools, how to deal with the urban fragmentation, uh, with uh, urban discrimination and exclusion um, from the right to the city. And um, this is not, um, these are not the same tools uh, uh, as those invented by modernist architecture. I think that uh, what is clear it is that the something new it is that the population resists. The starting points of resistance of the population concerning their city. If there was a referendum in Berlin about the use of Pentagon, uh, there, there is a referendum and people say no, we don't want to have housing in Paris. This is new and this is great, I think. Um, and we are pre actually precisely in these situations where people try to find solutions to a constraint and to a city that is not so generous as it should be for the population. When we see the development of Baugruppen in Berlin, when we see cooperative in Switzerland, etc., <coughs> it is all people that are not happy with the way the city still works with the developers, with the promotion, etc., etc. And they want, why uh, everyone uh, says at slogan, the affordability, sustainability, ecology, and precisely it is the contrary that is done, and it is uh, less and less affordable, and uh, the, the city are claiming about affordability. But in the same time, they are giving all their lands to the speculation in this sense, etc. So, and the population is at this time starting to resist. I like that. I think it will be the future. It will be more and more. But there is a sort of fight to be, uh, that exists. I, I, I went to Berlin for, for, for teaching because I, I, was the, I had the feeling that Berlin was probably the only European city that was different. Probably because of its his history, because of uh, the territory, this idea of a fragmented situation uh, without no limit. There is no suburb. I, in Paris, you have the city and the suburb. In, in Berlin, I don't know. Everything is suburb or everything is city. <laughs> <laughs> everything is territory. And uh, I had the feeling to, 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 I like to be to Berlin because I had the city, that the city by itself, not only by its population, by itself, by the structure of the space of the city, was able to resist. And still, 
city of Berlin by all its space is gone here. So we have uh, uh, Alexandria Platz is transformed, it's not so good. Uh, uh, we have uh, some, uh, the spray uh, is changing, but we have a resistance by the city and by its population. This is interesting. Okay. Um, when you, in, uh, in fact, I, I, I made some notes and I, I just want to, to to tip on another topic, which is really, you, you are both relating to the everyday of inhabitants, users. You are talking about partisanship. I, I, th I think you made quite clear how you would like to address this problem and, and partisanship means to, to, to get into, in, in the thick of things, as you said. As you said. Um, I noted two words, it was client and ground. Jean-Philippe, you were talking about ground when you started your presentation, meaning you're giving the ground to be appropriated. You were talking about partisanship. Um, I would just like you to, to elaborate a bit more on uh, how the user, the inhabitant, and the questions asked by, by this by this topic of appropriation, appro appropriating space, how this informs really your architecture. What, what other, I mean, you've already made it quite clear, and I would say this is my last question, and, and then uh, we should open the discussion. I think it's, we, we have to, so we see that this, uh, this interest of the population for space, and it is uh, really good. Uh, in the same time, so we are uh, architects, we are urbanists, we are making some studies, we are researching in the school, we are making uh, five or six years of research. Of, uh, so we, it means that we learn something. And uh, because we learn and something, I think we know something differently about space. So we are a sort of... Uh, and, and this is essential to not to take the situation as it is and to work with <coughs> participation, negotiation on the situation like it is. And I think what is important is to open the possibilities, to, to make the situations easier. It's why we talk about double space. When we find a way to produce this double space in an economic way, in a sustainable way, then it is very interesting to have the participation and negotiation. To discuss about pleasure instead to discuss about uh, disasters. <laughs> and I think it, it's our role of architects to try to find all the capacities, the opportunities of the city, and there are so many opportunities in the cities. And to see these possibilities because we have uh, make uh, the school and we take uh, experience uh, about uh, all the space, all the space is related to the outside, to the uh, And what we can do with this capacity in order to propose more for this negotiation and this uh, participation. And after that, we need to just to not to control the space, just to open the possibilities and to say in a generous, generous space, in a positive space, only good things can happen. And we have to be confident in all the users, all the inhabitants, to be as creative as they can be to use these spaces. So from my point of view, this question of participation should be taken in that way, by opening the possibilities. I think this is a crucial point, and we also have to discuss it very carefully, how uh, do we kind of also productively criticize participation. That's also what, 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 uh, what you did right now, and I think this is an important point, that we have to think about participation going beyond appeasement, going beyond affirmative action, going beyond bringing people into the possibility to decide things do not affect anything, and who have no perspective, maybe, uh, or, or visionary dimension. And I think there are, there are maybe, and then maybe on that point we differ in our projects we present, not in our general understanding, that, um, that I think one option is also not to kind of what participation is about, to offer opportunity for others to 
take part into what I suggested or we suggested or an opportunity we created or something that we offer as generously as possible, but still it's the, the brief, the terrain, the tools, the issue is set by someone who is in a position to do that. And this is a kind of what I, what I meant, the search that we are doing or the experiment, what is, and this is the word, where the word client, which is extremely stupid, comes in, where we offer or ask someone to become our client means to become our boss. Um, and this is not participation. This is what everybody who has money or power is doing. He asks people to help them, to bring, uh, to push their interests. And I think this is, and we are not doing this because we are against participation, because, but because we want to find out what happens in a dialogue. How can we come over purely affirmative um, or doing the existing or just repairing a shower, which is of course not the aim of this uh, of this weekend uh, in, in, uh, in this uh, refugee house. It was a kind of a starting point for a dialogue, which is a different starting point for a conversation um, than uh, a call for participation. Thank you both very much for your very interesting insights of your work. I have a question uh, regarding the, the projects um, from your team, Jesko. What is your answer to people who argue that this is kind of an appeasement strategy because it's, I mean, it's, it's an offer um, or an kind of uh, a very, very, very small thing to do and the, the problem always is, as the critics are saying, okay, this is so small and everyone is then content because they are doing something as yourself, you're conscious, you go to sleep at night and think, okay, I'm here, Skofitsa, are doing the right thing, but how about the, the main wheels which are rolling quite fast at the moment and uh, how about this question of upscaling such pro projects? Do you think that's possible? Do you think this is the right answer, upscaling? Do you think there has to be institutional changes of what we are thinking in bureaucratic ways and the city planning as a more a bigger stakeholder in this in this kind of development because these are all very very nice projects but they are few and they are small and I, i'm just interested in your answer to this uh, this is a, a, a crucial point Only one answer could be but it's not fair that this is a kind of academic project which has limitations in itself and i would not suggest it as a general model not suggest this as a perspective that works because you can't earn money with this this is one problem and the other problem you mentioned is that it will not kind of um, solve problems at a higher more important or crucial level so it's a kind of it's a training program um, which um, intends to have a better understanding about cooperation, about interests, and it's a search for new fields of design, because I think the classical fields of architecture, urbanism, product, industrial, graphic design, and whatever is there in this kind of classical design-oriented discipline uh, produce some gaps in between, where the real problems are sitting and where some clashes um, occur. Landscape is also part of this debate, and art also, of course. So um, this is one answer. The but of course, I think um, what is happening um, with this kind of biased or partisan design is that kind of, in each project, kind of supposed individual interest meet group interest, meet kind of local issues, and they become conflicts. And we are not able to solve these conflicts in all of these projects, which the pictures maybe suggest at some moments, the conflicts are more or less escalating, or maybe they are kind of confusing, and then we work at a certain part. But maybe this is one point, or one strategy among many others, that designers um, are able to kind of modify, define, escalate, bring into conscious or make visible conflicts already existing that are named by people, that are experienced by people, that are that people have to, are suffering from in a certain way. And if you bring them kind of into a debate among in inhabitants or citizens or among professionals or politicals, politicians, this could um, become something that can be upscaled. And of course, I think something like uh, support with in a widest thing, design issues uh, is something that should be offered on a more general level to inhabitants of cities. Because um, the same as um, with all the other um, areas of life, this is um, something that could be scaled up. I would just like to add, because I think it's really important to see this project. Uh, what is important, it is their precision. 
we need this precision because you you are with, with people you are in a sort of direct contact with some people with direct situation and what is important from this project it is a multiplication and the multiplication of plenty of projects like that it can be much bigger than one big project and this is very very important this way that this is urbanism this project it is project urbanism because the, the city will grow and will develop from the multiplication of this kind of project and the what is really important it is in this project you have everything that is claimed today ecology affordability sustainability precision delicacy economy etc etc it is about the multiplication of this project that so they are never too small I would suggest one last question. Yeah, um, I saw Robert. Uh, thanks. Um, actually, I just wanted to uh, take up this question of scalability and continue this discussion because I think it's very interesting and actually also believe it's um, at the heart of um, actual um, problems to like architectural practices. Um, because in a way, I, I really like both of your practices in different ways, but I find um, like, I feel like a little bit that the, um, um, the design beratung is, um, I think it, it creates interesting situation, but on the scale level, I, I guess I have the feeling that it remains um, symbolic. And um, I also find really interesting the, the approach of uh, the Lacaton Vassal practice, um, which is basically um, like uh, how I understand it, the core is providing like like a platform to the users, which then kind of also like create their own spaces. You know that there's no need for a designer in that sense. Um, but I believe, um, like I, I'm afraid that the kind of modernism. Um, like a worse modernism actually than the original modernism is really coming back at the moment, which is like a modernism without vision. You know, at least like in the 20s or 60s, modernism had an idea of a better living. And um, I don't know, like, like the, even if you see the project, you see that there was an idea of, 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 of a kind of a lifestyle or of a life in it. And I think in the present, we'd completely miss that. It's just purely about uh, distributing or like, surfaces and um, coming back to the client um, for me like how I, I see the the bottleneck in in the question of property like not only in terms of house ownership but actually also in in in, in terms of the agency in in um, yeah in being a client that's very that's very much connected to, to um, owning property or being um, in the position of um, 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 employing someone to design something. And what I find interesting, like to, th to think about kind of other or new bodies of clientship, which are maybe not, not private, but like kind of collective forms of, of being a client. Um, but I think this, this would, would, would need like new ownership models, you know, like connected to it. Which, because otherwise it would actually just remain symbolic um, and like this kind of appeasement um, participation. Co commenting. Okay. Would would you like to 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 answer or? Yes, of course. Um, this um, this is. Um, very important to consider the points that, that you mentioned for a fruitful discussion um, in, in the future um, beyond these kind of um, individual or, or smaller or uh, projects and um, and I think especially the, the the question of the client which I also mentioned is important and it's about new models of ownership or not ownership or anti ownership um, on every scale of society uh, which has to be developed and 
I can just can repeat myself and maybe repeat in the sense that Sean Philip mentioned it, that we try to kind of do this on a small scale, to make people our clients and giving us a brief who don't, do not own the building, do not own the garden, who do not own uh, a house or a street, but they have certain interests. And this is obviously the most exciting but also the most complicated point with these projects, that, uh, that people um, work on in spaces, in, uh, in zones that are not owned by them. Um, and these are new clients, and this is also what we all have to try out every day and you, who are the clients? Uh, and can we kind of modify the client's, uh, the client's perspective, the self-understanding, and how do we deal with new clients? We all used to have clients who give us a brief and then have the money to uh, make this brief reality. When this is not the case, things become very complicated, and uh, I think this is, for me and for myself, a very exciting search. I think it's uh, yeah, it's about the. I think we we have. I think it's difficult. It's uh, we try to actually we we are we are surrounded by a system more and more constrained system. I think it's uh, the characteristic of today. It is this situations where the market has defined a really rigid grid frame for everything of the kind of development look, uh, concerning especially housing. Um, and we are inside that. And we cannot escape to that. And it is very difficult. And it is all these experiments to try how to escape to this general system, which has made that the flat becomes a uh, a financial product. So how we can escape to this point? The problem of property is one of them. So we could rent, or we could uh, say uh, hotels everywhere, just to, uh, but the question it is to, es to escape to that. What we try, it is to, to do this double space. Each time we have a, a commission, we, one part is exactly the brief. And the second one is the same volume of space, undefined, free, without any function. And we try to do both of them in the same budget as the standard one. And then we have this combination of two spaces that offer the possibilities and that offer the relations. Because actually, we have the feeling that situation is more and more com contrained, and between the program, the budget, and the uh, developer's uh, brief, there is no possibility of freedom. So, I would thank you both a lot and thanks for those wonderful questions. I think the question of scale is, is very, very interesting and uh, uh, because it really uh, has, a, has a big impact on, on how you can deal with projects and uh, how, how you can resist in the city. Uh, maybe we can discuss it um, now. Um, we're making a, a short break, I think. Yeah. Thanks a lot. <laughs>